a few housekeeping items. This session will be recorded. Also, we will have everyone muted during the session. And during the Q&A, you'll have the opportunity to raise your hand to ask a question. This session is also supported by Antonio Flores, who will help with tech support, Stephanie Bielke, who will help with the chat questions, Katie Krigbaum, who will assist with Q&A, and Judy Pollock, who will provide the closing comments. My, my name is Jill Nyland, and I'm representing the Chicago Ornithological Society tonight. We're very happy to welcome Laura Erickson to the, to the Compelling Voices in Birding and Conservation series, which is a special lecture series that highlights the voices of women and people of color in the birding and conservation world. Our series is hosted by the Chicago Audubon Society, Chicago Ornithological Society, and the Peggy Nobart Nature Museum in Chicago. I wanna thank all our sponsoring organizations tonight who have done so much to contribute to the series. We encourage you to become a member of our host organizations your membership will help, help support this free series, as well as many more birding and co conservation programs and activities happening, happening here in Chicago. Um, we, we will put our website uh, URLs in the chat that you can refer to, as well as our Facebook um, identifiers, our Facebook page names. So take a look at those. So did anybody have a interesting breeding bird sighting that they want to mention tonight? Piping plovers, perhaps. <laughs> Many of us are out there or either as a volunteer or as a bystander, right? Watching the piping plovers here at Montrose Beach. Anybody? A lot of the breeding birds are, have, have had their young and the young are fledging and dispersing, so you're not as likely to find them right now. But Paula has a Paula has a person. You get then mute Paula. Yeah, I'm okay. here. So I just wanted to tell everybody in Chicago that Nish, you one of your chicks from last year, uh, is now taking care of uh, Nelly has split. So Nish is taking care of the four babies now that are at uh, Mommy Bay. And I'm in Ohio, so that's why. <laughs> oh, great! Thank so, you. Yeah, that's that's good to know. It's always interesting how the the females leave <laughs> and and leave the, the young behind with the guy, which I think is great. <laughs> but, um, anyway, <clears throat> so let's get started. We're happy to welcome Laura Erickson, producer of For the Birds, the longest running radio program about birds in the United States since 1986 and author of 12 books about birds and conservation, bird conservation. She started bird watching in 1974 and later taught school kids about birds in Wisconsin. Laura served as a li licensed wildlife rehabilitator focused primarily on songbirds and especially common nighthawks while she was a stay-at-home mom in the 80s and 90s. She has counted raptors and songbirds at Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory and other sites in Duluth, Minnesota and studied nighthawk digestion as part of an ill-fated PhD project. Tonight, she will talk about her latest book, The Love Lives of Birds, which provides insights into the vastly different courtship, mating, and parenting habits among bird species. Laura? Well, I am utterly thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm talking about this book, but I'm in Chicago. I'm from Chicago, oh. and I love Chicago. I joined Chicago Audubon uh, because of the piping plovers, because of all the work people were doing and the great information being provided online. But I grew up loving the Chicago Cubs. I, I have seen a peregrine falcon fly over Wrigley Field, just for the record. I was going to marry Ernie Banks when I was five years old, but <laughs> tragically that did not happen. Um, I saw my very first snowy owl 
walking with my husband down Lakeshore Drive in December 1975, finishing out my first calendar year of birding. That was the very first owl I ever saw. And he flew right over my head, looking down and its eyes met mine. It was the coolest thing. So that's Chicago for me. I saw my first monk parakeets over at the park over in Hyde Park. And the piping plovers, that is just so wonderful that they're nesting in Chicago now. I'm talking, um, I'm focusing uh, on birds I covered in this book, The Love Lives of Birds, but I co-authored this book, Into the Nest, which has amazing photographs. I made Mari Reed the co-author because she was the photo editor, but the book the photos were so amazing that it had to be part of, um, I just figured she deserved co-author status. And I'm using photos from this book, as well as my own photos in this presentation tonight. You'll know it's from the book because I'll have a little picture of the book in the bottom corner and the photographer listed. But um, if it doesn't have those, it means I am the one who took the picture. So birds have a bunch of different strategies and different ways that they fall in love, that they find a mate and all that. Um, some birds do not form a pair bond at all. They mate in a little happenstance thing and they never bond with a bird of the opposite sex or stick with them for any amount of time. What are the reasons for this? Um, sustaining a pair bond takes time and energy and trust. And who needs that? You don't have to stick with one bird for long. You could be free as a bird. Whether you're a male or a female, if someone better turns up, you can take advantage of hookups. If you're a successful female, you can produce babies with more genetic diversity. And if you're a successful male, you could produce way more offspring and have more genetic diversity than if you're committed to one female, then you're just limited to the number of offspring her body can produce. If you're the bird taking care of the babies, if you're a phalarope, that means you're the male, or if you're a piping plover, or if you're a female taking care of the uh, babies and something bad happens to your co-parent, it doesn't affect your chicks at all because they didn't need that. Uh, they wasn't part of the picture anyway. If you're the bird not taking care of the babies and something bad happens to your co-parent, well, at least you haven't placed, put all your eggs in one basket. If you're a hummingbird uh, mating with all kinds of females and one of them dies, yeah, you've lost some genetic stuff, but you have other babies too. So, uh, so this is an example of a bird that doesn't have any kind of a pair bond. There are advantages to having that pair bond. Once you find a mate, you can focus on egg production and raising young. You don't have to constantly spend your time seeking out and trying to impress members of the opposite sex. You can share the responsibilities of raising young so it's not all your job or all your mate's job. As a co-parent, that gives you lots of influence on how successful your broods are. And so those are some pretty good advantages to having a pair bond. Now, some birds have a lifelong pair bond. They have all the advantages of that pair bond. Plus, they can go years without needing to actively attract and select a good mate unless something bad happens to the mate. Most of the birds that have lifelong pair bonds tend to be fairly long lived, so they don't have to find a new mate too often. And your mate sticks with you has your back, providing warnings and at least some level of protection against threats. And this is an excellent example of a bird with a lifelong pair bond, though bald eagles don't stay together over the winter. Uh, 
they just both come back to the same nest in the spring and they're passionately in love with that nest. There are also advantages to just a seasonal pair bond. You have all the advantages of a pair bond, but you don't have to keep track of your mate during migration or winter. Uh, if you go down to say Florida for the winter and your mate goes down to say Texas, um, it doesn't matter, you're, you, you're not sending Facebook messages or Zooming or anything, you just, have no idea how that one's doing, but if it shows up again in the spring, yay, you can have babies together again. And you don't have to worry about your mate surviving. It's just not, not it's a simple thing. And these are not you guys as piping plovers. These are for, uh, pictures I took in Maine. Uh, some birds, though, are just not the marrying kind, and I'm going to start with those tonight. Mallards are, they sort of form a pair bond, but it's not, it's almost, but not quite the right thing. Um, remember that charming children's story, Make Way for Ducklings, with Jack, Cack, Lack, Mac, Mac, Oak, Pack, and Quack, staying with their mom, for a while who, uh, when their father leaves for a little while, they're all going to find him again. Um, and they're all uh, totally bonded as a family unit, even though dad had to work separately for a while. But um, the Washington Post would give this book for Pinocchios. It's not true at all that, uh, that mallards bond like that. Males are extremely, extremely uh, ridden with testosterone. The word mallard, the M-A-L-L, -L, comes from Old French for masculine or male. And the A-R-D is pejorative, like drunkard or sluggard, because they epitomize the worst of what we think of as masculinity. Male mallards will mate with anything that will hold still long enough. I've actually watched one once trying to mate with a rock. Uh, this one is trying to mate with a male. Uh, this uh, picture I took in Superior, Wisconsin a few winters ago, all the males are gathered around this duck who happens to be a common eider. Uh, so not even closely related. And they were all, hoping to make it with her. They'll mate with anybody. Female mallards select a male who seems so interested in her and that he's not paying attention to other female ducks. Uh, she wants a male who will stick with her. And we might have a male mallard from Duluth, Minnesota, who meets up with a female mallard from Chicago when they're way down in Louisiana in the winter, he will follow her back to Chicago. And she's hoping he will stick with her, but he can't help. She wants him to be protecting her from other males. Uh, females are sometimes drowned when uh, they won't use the term gang rape in ornithology, but you can have multiple males all descending on one female and they made in the water and females have drowned under those circumstances. It's just not a fun thing. So she wants a male who will protect her, but he can't help himself every now and then. He's eyeing the chick next door and she's left unattended. So there's about at least a 50% chance when you're talking about mallards in sort of wild areas in the prairie states where more than one of their babies has a different dad than the male who was sticking with the female during the time she was laying her eggs. Uh, it's called multiple paternity. But they mate and he sticks with her. She lays one egg a day. 
Uh, sometimes she misses a day. She has one functional ovary. So usually it's just ovulating one at a time and it's about every, a little bit more than every 24 hours. And he wants to be with her during all the days that she's making eggs because otherwise another male's gonna come in and um, uh, some of the babies will not be his. So his job is to stick with her during the time that she's producing eggs. And after she makes a nice, pretty humongous clutch when you think about it, um, his duties are done as soon as she loses interest in sex because she's broody now and starting to incubate the eggs, he leaves. And he goes off and hangs out with other males. Uh, I love seeing baby ducks when they're tiny like this, because you could see as many as you saw the eggs in the nest. But day after day, that poor little group gets fewer and fewer because of snapping turtles and other things in the water. I took this picture at Disney World, so I had to throw it in, but the mother does all the, the child care. The father is totally gone, not part of the picture. They were only together during the time she was producing eggs, but it works. Uh, some birds are more into speed dating, and I know you don't have prairie chickens right in Chicago, but you probably still should, like we should. Um, these birds, the, they do not form any kind of a bond. The males get together on what is called a lek, and they're all showing off for each other. And they're not paying much attention to the females, just like when someone's running a marathon, they might be kind of cheered by crowds cheering, but their focus is on their, the other runners and making it to the finish line. And these guys are focused on each other, each trying to be the biggest, toughest, most vigorous displayer. Females are the judges and they uh, tend to gravitate to one or two winners in the lack who they mate with, but the other males don't even seem to really be bothered by that. They're more focused on improving their, uh, just like a runner who doesn't win the marathon, uh, doesn't think it was a waste of time to be in it. They just keep trying. And um, uh, this has sound, but I don't think you can pick it up very well. They, they're dancing, these air sacs on the side of their throat, they can inflate. They're just air sacs that are part of their um, respiratory system. And they also, those are air sacs on their, what look like eyebrows that they can inflate. But they're just showing off and um, mainly focused on other males. And this guy's going to get chased away, actually, by a, a young male who's smaller. But they just are. <laughs> um, it works. Uh, the females go off, lay their eggs. Uh, they come to the lack every day to mate again. and. Uh, after a while, all the females are on eggs and the males keep dancing. And the reason for that is that a fox might discover one nest and eat all the eggs and the female has to start all over again. And the males that are still there are the ones who have a chance to reproduce again. So they go for longer than it seems sensible. Uh, turkeys are really into um, just separating the sexes and having their own special clubs for the boys and the girls. The males hang out together and they do a lot of their displaying. Uh, they'll do it when females are nearby, but they're also doing it in a sort of aggressive way to maintain their literal pecking order. Um, the, the top Tom is the one who gets to show off the most and the females all hang out together. You will see young males in flocks with females in the winter, but as the young males get older, the ones that hatched the previous summer, they go off and join the adult males. And, but so it's very sex divided 
when it's not the breeding season. And when it is, most of the females will mate at least several times with the top tom, but they'll also have little, um, you know, little hookups with the other males. And so there's a very high probability if you did little uh, paternity tests on the baby turkeys in a clutch that more than one father was involved. And they don't uh, bond with the dad. As a matter of fact, the states that have hunting seasons on turkeys very often have them as spring hunting season. So that seems counterproductive because that's when they're raising babies, right? That's when you need the parents, but you don't need the dads. And indeed, some of them, especially the lower ranking ones, will actually eat baby turkeys as well as any other easy meat they can find. And so taking them out of the picture does not hurt the population at all. But it works. That's why we have more than uh, more turkeys than we used to have. They are showing up north of Duluth now in the famous Saxim bog, the sort of wilderness bog in northern Minnesota, where you can see great gray owls and northern hawk owls and sometimes boreal owls, and every now and then a whole group of turkeys now. Hummingbirds do not form any kind of emotional bond between the females. And I say they're like Rosie the Riveter during World War II when the females were busy on the home front doing all the important things and the males were off fighting the war. And the funny thing is that war that male ruby-throated hummingbirds are fighting is really, really important for the baby hummingbirds. Uh, the female is the one who does all the work. She's the, uh, the pretty one if you're not into primary colors. Um, the male, you know, they're just off fighting everybody. One time I watched a hummingbird in northern Wisconsin sitting on a wire and I had my spotting scope on it. And suddenly it started looking really agitated and looking up to the side and it zoomed up and I tracked it with my binoculars to a bald eagle flying over. And apparently once the bald eagle reached this hummingbird's defended column of airspace, it started dive bombing the eagle from above, up, down, up, down on the nape of the, ne of the eagle's neck. And I don't even think the eagle noticed the little twerp uh, when I did a comparison of the tenth of an ounce that a hummingbird weighs versus a bald eagle's weight. Eagles weigh 1,600 times what a male ruby-throated hummingbird weighs. So he didn't even notice them, but he was flying in the, he just kept going the same direction. And eventually that took him out of the column of defended airspace. And the male came back to the exact spot on the wire because he was still in my spotting scope. Only now he was making all these uh, chittery sounds and puffing out his breast and it was really funny, like he really thought he chased it away. And that seems really stupid, a waste of energy. But it's so important that he does this. The female's the one who builds the nest and lays the eggs. She lays two eggs and notice how thick the walls are on this nest, how compact it is. When she builds it, the nest's job is to be an incubator. And do you see how tightly she's fitting in? Her body heat isn't leaking out the sides where her sides are meeting the walls. Uh, it's tight enough that all the body heat from her brood patch is going to those two eggs. And she's gonna have to take off to feed those babies. And when she's off the nest, they're getting cold. Uh, they nest up here in Duluth, Minnesota, where we can have mornings in June that are in the 30s and sometimes even the upper 20s. We did early this June. And the baby hummingbirds need to stay warm. So the male's job, even though he 
maybe doesn't even know where babies come from and doesn't know that these are his babies. His job keeping everything out of the flowers except the female hummingbird enables her to go and spend the minimal amount of time off the nest. She can uh, gather nectar and come right back because the flowers still have their nectar. And she sticks that sharp beak down their throats and knows how to do it. And they keep growing because she kept getting all the nectar and bugs. She builds a new nest for each brood because the babies, as they grow, they push uh, the nest walls get thinner and more spread out. It has to go from that egg incubator and bassinet into a crib and into a sort of big kid bed before they uh, fledge. Uh, so the males war against everybody anywhere near the flowers and sometimes a bald eagle flying over is really important for ensuring that the flowers nectar supply stays uh, nice and big. Uh, the males will chase things like this hummingbird moth away. This is a sphinx moth. And so the males are only important during the time when the females are actually keeping the chicks warm. And so as soon as the chicks start fledging, uh, when uh, the females are done nesting, sometimes they'll have a second nest, but when they're done and have lost interest in sex and also uh, there's no more reason for males to keep anybody away from the flowers, they migrate. They're totally unnecessary now. And uh, as uh, you know, years with droughts, the flowers can have a really hard time producing enough nectar. And so the, if he's gone, that's less pressure on the food supply. The adult females leave when the babies can get their own food so that again, they won't be competing for that food. The babies cannot migrate until their muscles and body fat have, uh, are in the right condition for nesting. And so um, it always seems this is, that's also the reason loon adults migrate leaving the babies on the lakes. So they're not competing for the fish that the babies need. And in both the cases of hummingbirds and loons, the babies know exactly how to migrate. They just need to wait for their bodies to be ready to do it. But so they spend a lot of time at flowers and bird feeders and um, then get the heck out of here. They go down to the Gulf. Uh, the ones that are in really good shape my uh, a pig out at the Gulf and then take off over the water to get to the Yucatan Peninsula. And males are leaving now uh, to head down there. Um, the uh, females will get down there and then the babies will. If they don't have enough body fat, they'll take the long route following the Gulf around. Uh, but if they have enough um, body mass, they just take off over the water and they do it during hurricane season. Um, Red-winged blackbirds are like a hippie commune, one big happy family, no kind of real pair bonds. Uh, males just love to display. Um, they're in the hippie commune year round, except in the winter they don't have sex, but during the breeding season, everybody has sex with everybody. Um, they are totally indiscriminate. The females pick a male who has the best territory uh, that she can defend. He'll attract several females. The better the territory, the more females he'll attract to it. He'll mate with them and he will help take care of all those babies that are on his territory. Uh, but not all of them will be his babies. And there will be females on territories other than his who have his babies. So it's pretty amazing how they uh, just are so into making sure there's lots and lots of genetic mixing. Uh, females build the nests. 
and do all the incubating, but the males take care. And they have really interesting looking eggs and really adorable little babies. And the females do a lot of the child care, but males feed the babies too. All my pictures are females though, but that works. And then some birds have more complicated systems for one reason or another. Uh, chickadees live in Jane Austen's world uh, with proper social distancing, whether or not we're in the middle of a pandemic, they like having a distance between one chickadee and the next. Oops, what did I do? It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single chickadee in possession of a good territory must be in want of a mate. Uh, but actually they don't choose their territory until they found the mate because they find where they're going to nest together. And they work together um, in building the, excavating the cavity. They are very provincial like Jane Austen, they stay within their neighborhood and their whole lives they associate with a small circle of acquaintances, season after season, year after year. The babies that a pair of chickadees produces do not join their parents' flocks. When they separate from the parents, when they're feeling independent, each baby chickadee tends to join a different social flock than either their parents or any of their siblings so that they don't have to worry about remembering who their parents and siblings are. They'll not accidentally pick one as a mate. Uh, that's a convenient thing. Some infidelity has always occurred with chickadees. The males who sing the most attract females to mate with them. Um, and um, it's just like Mrs. Bennett might have said, I assure you there is quite as much of that going on with chickadees as with people. Uh, to the undiscerning eye, chickadees activities appear to be nothing more than a quick succession of busy nothings. But if you're observant, you notice the individuals and their relationships and the dramas within chickadee flocks. Uh, chickadees, just like in um, good old England, um, maintain strict, stable social hierarchies, and they marry across. The, uh, the top male in a flock mates with the top female and it goes down the line and their, their relationship, their first winter, uh, they get a mate and they stay together. And as birds die at the top of the line, the birds work their way up. Uh, if the top chickadee female loses her mate, she doesn't drop in status uh, she finds an unattached male and he makes it to the top of the social hierarchy just by marrying her. And the same if the female dies, uh, when the male finds an unattached female, the highest ranking one he can find, he sticks with, um, uh, she rises in social status. The big difference between chickadees and Jane, um, Jane Austen's world is that uh, mother chickadees have no interest in their daughter's marriage prospects. Their daughters have all moved on when they're marriageable and uh, the parents don't maintain ties. Uh, young chickadees start out having to try and establish themselves on the social ladder. I took this picture out my window. This chickadee was trying to get an adult chickadee to see how big and important he was, uh, trying to get high on the new 
social ladder. The adults just ignore them. Uh, it's the young birds that actually will respond and try and puff out too, but they look really ridiculous when they're trying to look as big and important as they can. This is something to watch for in August and September with your chickadees because the babies are so adorable when they're working their way into a new flock. Um, but Elizabeth uh, Bennett could have been um, uh, uh, a chickadee when she noted about Darcy. He is a gentleman. I am a gentleman's daughter. So far, we are equal. And I took this picture out my window. They work together as a pair when they excavate their hole. The female does the nest building after the pair has excavated the hole. Uh, the male spends time uh, singing and maintaining their territory and feeding her when she starts uh, laying eggs and incubating. Um, he does a lot of feeding her. And that's just the way they divide their tasks for their to find true domestic felicity. Um, they're very egalitarian. Uh, the male feeds her while she's doing the, inc uh, the incubating, and she broods the young hatchlings. But um, so he feeds the whole family. So this is a male. But when the, ba when the babies are big enough to stay warm enough, the female is also feeding them, and both parents attend them during the entire time the babies are dependent. Uh, my chickadees, the one in this picture, uh, their babies fledged, I think it was June 4th, and the family is still together now uh, the parents uh, the babies are still begging for food and the parents are sometimes feeding them but sometimes saying go away uh, both parents also share diaper duty cleaning out the fecal sacs as the babies produce them it's very convenient the way uh, baby songbirds poop as soon as they swallow and they make a big production of it wiggling their little tails and and making their rear and go really high up. And so it's really obvious because the cavities are pretty dark. This one is very deep in the tree. And uh, so it's dark down there, but this is white and the baby did a lot of movement so the parent can see it to grab it. When the babies were very little before the bacteria was kicking in in their gut, they weren't getting all the nutrition out of their food and the parents would eat the fecal sacs. They weren't toxic yet and they still had a lot of nutrition. But at this point, uh, the bacteria is working just fine and the parents carry it out and dump it somewhere away from the nest. And the little baby chickadees, it's all, uh, this is my, my last fledgling in my nest. It's gonna work its way up and it's making this little chickadee call and the dad, is in a lilac bush behind the camera. So the baby's hearing the dad who sings a couple times and makes the chickadee and the baby has never come up to the entrance before. And so the whole big world is pretty bewildering. And the dad just sang a song, the baby wants to fledge, but there's an airplane flies over and there's noise and it's kind of scary. So he can't, decide what to do and he gets intimidated for one last moment he's going to back down um, i'm taking pictures from the side and i had a camera on a tripod taking the movie uh, and all of a sudden he's going to get scared and back in again and then he'll take off but it was really interesting to me how the dad was the one who kept coming and luring the babies out, calling to them. And the mother was with the, the birds that had already fledged. So now he's doing his last little intimidated thing, checking out what's going on around him. And the dad calls and he decides, what the heck, I'm going. And um, it works. 
the word Casanova means new house. And house wrens are singing literal Casanovas. Uh, they're little realtors. The male sings profusely when he's by a cavity. He's advertising to get a female to choose one of his cavities. And he'll st put sticks into several cavities, uh, trying to get a female to pick one. Uh, this guy, uh, after my chickadees moved out, house rent, one house wren started putting sticks in and um, they haven't used the nest, but it was ready just in case female would pick that one. But the whole idea is to produce little baby house wrens and uh, the male is advertising all these cavities that are all stuffed with sticks. And when the female picks one, he stays with her, they feed the babies. After the babies fledge, she very often leaps, just like with the piping plovers. She goes off because she's been listening to other males singing. When her body is ready, she will move in with another guy and start a new nest. Meanwhile, her original mate is still taking care of the fledglings, but he's also singing by all his other cavities. And if he attracts a mate, she will mate with him and uh, she will lay eggs and incubate them while he's busy feeding the fledglings from his first brood. And then they're ready to be independent right when the new fledgling, uh, the new babies hatch. So now he's busy with another brood. And that maximizes the number of baby house wrens that they can produce. When you think about it, their nests can have five and six babies in them, repeat, uh, you know, and sometimes they can even have three nestings in a summer. And yet we end up with the same number of house wrens year after year, there's high mortality. So they have to produce as many babies as they can, and it works. Uh, bluebirds are in a soap opera, like the bold and the beautiful. Uh, the males do this wing wagging and all this lovely stuff uh, to entice a female. Uh, they have their mate, but they will also mate with other females. They'll go to, uh, to visit other females and they'll let other females come and visit them. Uh, this is a photo showing bluebirds feeding each other mealworms. And a lot of people feed a lot of mealworms, uh, put them out for chickadees and bluebirds and things. Mealworms are great for the protein they provide, but they do not provide calcium. And uh, when birds eat too many of them, especially nestlings, uh, they can have problems with bone development. So it's important not to feed too, not to give them too many mealworms. But the female does a lot of the, the, the work while the male does a lot of the, um, the work of defending that nest, trying to keep other males away, except when he's visiting the chick next door. And, um, and he'll do a lot of the childcare when they hatch and it works. Uh, robins, uh, their song has not changed over time. They just sing the same song, the males sing, and uh, they get extremely territorial in the spring. Uh, in Chicago, you can see robins all year round. Up here in Duluth, Minnesota, we have robins all winter long. During the winter, they are gregarious birds who live in flocks and feed on berries. But all of a sudden, as winter draws to a close, they get territorial and they get a little uh, crazy about it. That's right when the males start singing and they will chase off other robins, including their reflection in a window and it can drive people crazy. You have to break the reflection by putting something on the outside of the window so he can't see himself for a few days. Uh, the males help with uh, nest um, 
construction materials, but the female's the one who builds the nest. Uh, the male will help bringing stuff. They have to wait. To, uh, we One year we had a drought in early spring and the female came back, they had their territory all set up and she could not start building the nest until we got a rainfall. So she had mud. But once they have enough wet, stuff to uh, then they get together they usually do most of their mating activities early in the morning they meet together where worms are still out and they're feeding so they have a uh, sort of a morning romantic interlude instead of bagels they have worms and are all romantic and the whole point is to raise these babies and when the babies get uh, uh, fledged the dad stays with them and mates again with the mom she starts a new nest lays new eggs and um it, and incubates them while he's taking care of the fledglings and singing and then the new babies are ready when the fledglings are independent and it works. Uh, cardinals, the female sings way more than people realize. The male does all the singing in the winter, but both of them sing in the spring. And the female songs are actually more complex than the males, but they can't help it. They're very romantic when they um, are together. I took this on our swing set. And the male feeds her when she's incubating. Sometimes he will take turns incubating. And the whole point is to raise these adorable babies. And it works. And they'll nest more than once during the summer, um, two or three times if they uh, can. Um, some of some birds really do make a lifelong commitment. Uh, pigeons are one of the ones that stay together for life. They are so romantic. Um, some studies have shown that pigeons that are two different colors uh, will not select each other as mates. They prefer a mate that looks like them. And other studies have found the opposite. There's no way we know how pigeons select their mates. But once they do, they are extremely devoted. And it's quite romantic. And they're hard to find their nests. They tend to be in crevices, uh, you know, in bridges or on walls and things. And um, the whole point is to raise their babies. And the babies the parents keep their urban, sophisticated, mingling with people lives separate from their home life. So uh, we don't often see baby pigeons while we can recognize that they are babies, but they stay with their parents for a while afterward and it works. Uh, screech owls for some reason, and nobody knows how they do it, they tend to have a mate who is exactly their age. And we can understand how, you know, baby screech owls when they're uh, when they're a year old and are looking for their first mate will end up with one that's the same age. But when a six year old screech owl loses its mate, it manages usually to find a mate who's five, six or seven. Um, and nobody knows quite how they do that. This was my education screech owl for many years. He came from Ohio. Uh, they come in two different colors. Some are red and some are gray. And the red ones, uh, their feathers are a little looser, uh, not quite as good insulation, but may help them cool off more. So red ones tend to be more common the further south you go. Um, but they're finding that the red ones are little by little working their way north becoming more prevalent. And that is probably a change with climate change. But they nest in cavities. They often have two different cavities and the pair sometimes stay, sleeps together in one of them and sometimes they sleep in the other one. The cavity is the only 
extended territory. They're like condo owners who have a common space that other screech owls can share, but they wanna keep other screech owls out of their apartment. And that works. Uh, great horned owls get romantic right at Valentine's Day. Uh, this is uh, from my, uh, I put out a trail cam and I have no idea. I put it in the feeder to see if I was getting any flying squirrels, but I got this great horned owl last summer and um, I have, or last fall. And he obviously wasn't interested in the feeder. He was just using it as a perch, but it was pretty cool to, uh, and unexpected to see that. Uh, the, when they're hooting, they have the soft mellow. <laughs> the female is a larger bird, but her voice is deeper. And that's because the male has a slightly larger skull and a slightly larger uh, a syrinx, which is their voice box. And so he's making the deeper sound. And when you hear two of them, calling simultaneously, you'll hear a higher voice and a lower voice like <laughs> and you can tell one's the male and one's the female. And they're very romantic to each other. They stay in vocal contact year round, the pair. They're very devoted to each other, but they often space themselves in winter so they can uh, have a larger hunting area but they stay, like I said, calling occasionally. And they lay these beautiful pure, pure white eggs and their babies are adorably fuzzy. And the, uh, it's the mother who usually stays on the nest. Uh, there's a, this nest was in Ithaca, uh, New York, and uh, there's the female in the nest. And I have no idea how she could come and go, but that was, the way they did it, um, but it works. Crows are extremely devoted. They're very sophisticated lovers. I compared them in my book to Nick and Nora Charles in the old movies. Uh, the pair is very, very romantic and gentle to each other. The first sign of spring is really when you start seeing crows carrying sticks to build a nest. And we know a lot about crows from Ithaca, New York, where a guy named Kevin McGowan at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has been tracking the crows there for decades. And every time he, he uh, finds a nest in the spring. He bands the babies, puts tags on their wings. He uses a different color each year so that you can look at the crows. And if you see the patch, you know what year it hatched and they have numbers. So he knows which individuals they are. And he climbs up to take pictures of, um, uh, to get the keep track of all the nests and when the babies are big enough um, the male feeds the female they also have young from previous years who help too um, but they are so so tender with their babies uh, they can lay as many as five eggs and last year all four babies that I saw with the parents as young fledglings uh, made it all the way um, through uh, into the winter. They were still together. But the baby crows, I find them adorable, but some people think they're a little creepy looking, but they are very sweet little birds. And these are obviously in one of Kevin McGowan's groups. So they all have their wing tags on and he can keep track of them all. They have very bright red mouths. Uh, here's my brood, uh, the family of six, the parents and all four babies were in my feeder together. I would put peanuts in there for them and it works. And then there's love on the beach. I saved the best for last because I love piping plovers. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Maine taking pictures when I could have just been in Chicago, I guess. Uh, they feed 
in the sand, in the ocean, where they have the tides, uh, the food changes during different stages of the tide and the birds act different than they do on Lake Michigan. But one of my friends, uh, Susan Cecil, um, uh, let me use some of her photos of Monty and Rose. So Rose is the one on the left. And this is from 2019. And this is one of my pictures of what of the male incubating um, and in a cage. These are at Popham Beach State Park in Maine. And here's Rose and one of the chicks from 2019, one of Susan's pictures. But here's my picture because I could get um, I had a nice long lens, so I was having fun. Uh, there's actually three babies under her in this picture, and it's uh, I want you to look at this picture because when the babies get under, this is on the ocean, but you can get pretty strong cold breezes in Chicago too. And the first, the most important place to warm the baby is its head, right? And look at how vascularized the tissue is right there where the babies snuggle under the mom and dad's wings. That vascular tissue is hot. The bird's body temperature is probably about 103 or four degrees. And so that warms up the baby nice and quick. That's why they go under the parents. And they're just so adorable. They can't help it. And it works. Uh, the mother leaves early though, because her body produced those four eggs. Both parents incubate, but the mother's body was really exhausted in producing the eggs. And so the reason the dad stays is because she's invested all her body energy at the beginning and he does at the end and works. And that's the end. So I hope you all stay safe and well. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. I think we, we do have some questions. If I can just go through um, them as they as they appeared in response to your, your talk, Laura. Uh, Finn asked um, if uh, the female prairie chicken mates again every day, does that mean her clutch may be fathered by multiple males? Definitely. Uh, the cool thing with prairie chickens is uh, the top male, the one that is just like the one who always wins the gold medal in the Olympics, he will have mated with almost all the females around that come to that particular luck. But the females aren't bound by that. They can go to any male they feel like. And so very, it's called multiple paternity. And the prairie chickens never ever demand paternity tests, so they don't really care. Okay, but Lisa he, asked uh, a question about redheads. She saw them mating in March near Chicago. And since they don't actually breed here, she was wondering what were they doing or why were they doing that? Um, the males of all ducks get sort of oversexed before the females do. And the, um, the females uh, sometimes will have ovulated. They don't usually ovulate before they are completely done building their nest. So the nest is ready for the egg. Each of those eggs takes a lot of her nutritional energy. So um, they, the female's usually not completely receptive, but sometimes she has no alternative because male ducks can be pretty aggressive, but she probably was not yet ovulating if she hadn't completed her nest. Birds are very interesting. Their sex organs are excess weight, uh, excess cargo when they're flying. And so most bird species, the male's testes and the female's ovaries atrophy and are 
um, very small, except during the nesting season. Uh, birds like cranes and eagles, uh, they all their dancing or flying displays or uh, with trumpeter swans, their cool displays in the water, all those are setting both the birds' bodies to be ready to uh, be producing. So he's producing sperm when she's receptive and producing eggs. And so th they're probably, uh, sometimes though ducks do, if something steals their nest or something bad happens, they do what's called dumping, where they lay their eggs in another duck's nest. Uh, that's very common with wood ducks and hooded mergansers in particular. So every now and then you'll see a baby hooded merganser in with a flock a family of wood ducks. And um, it's any port in a storm when her body has to lay the egg, it'll at least give the baby some chance of survival. Well, that's really fascinating. Uh, a question about hummingbirds. Um, Elaine asked if um, male hummingbirds aim to keep other birds away from the nectar source for the female, why do they also chase females away from that source as well? Um, most males, the one thing they respect is the female. Uh, hummingbirds are one of the species where the female is larger than the male. And she has those white spots on her tail that she can flare. And that's one of the very few things that male hummingbirds normally <sighs> respect. So, uh, so he's not as likely to chase the female away as other birds and insects. OK. Um, then Lois asked a question about morning dove and whether their pairs are as um, relatively egalitarian as you described in some other bird species? Um, morning doves, I'm, I'm not that sure. I think the female does all the incubating, but both the parents produce pigeon milk. Um, uh, the doves and uh, pigeons actually slough off tissue in their esophagus, in their crop which is an offshoot of the esophagus that is very similar in chemical composition to milk. And both of them, uh, so they don't regurgitate seeds at first when the babies hatch, they're both feeding that pigeon milk to the babies and they feed it by regurgitation. Uh, but then as the babies get bigger, they will also be regurgitating some of their other contents of their uh, crop and their stomach. So it'll have some semi-digested seeds and then less digested seeds as the babies get bigger. But both parents do feed the babies and they, um, uh, so they're probably pretty egalitarian. The female is the one who incubates, I'm pretty sure, with morning doves. They're most famous for being really poor builders. Many morning doves nest on the ground. And the ones that nest in trees, uh, some of them seem to be using instructions for nesting on the ground where the bottom sort of stays together. The very first morning dove nest I ever found, I was so excited. And it was at a little below my eye level in a shrub in Lansing, Michigan. And the bottom looked a little like, like they weren't done building yet. But the next day I came and the eggs were gone and I thought a predator had taken them. But I looked below and the two eggs had dropped through the nest floor because it was so flimsy. So they should they focus hire an architect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hire a house run. <laughs> really. Um, then Elaine asked another question. She asked whether it's possible to distinguish a male and female chickadee from each other. Oh, I should have thrown in pictures. You can only tell them in the hand uh, during the only during the breeding season. Uh, the male develops in many birds, uh, they have what's called a cloacal protuberance, just a little area. Uh, when birds mate, uh, they, they, they um, 
they only have one opening in their private parts, and that's called the cloaca. That's where the intestines empty, that's where the ureters empty, and that's where the oviduct empties, and that's where the, um, the seminal vesicles empty. It's all one little vestibule entrance to the house. So they always have to poop before they have sex. But um, <laughs> um, the female, uh, the male will have a little protuberance there, a little bump that uh, just helps seal his cloaca against the females while they're not mating. Uh, the female will have what's called a brood patch. She's the one who incubates the eggs. So if you're holding a chickadee during banding, you can, uh, banders usually use a straw so they can focus. Um, and they blow on it, and that will expose on a male the cloacal protuberance and on a female that bald spot. Uh, the males do 90% of the singing. So if you hear a chickadee singing, you know that it, you have a 90% chance that it's the male. But and if you actually catch them mating, the male's the one on top. But otherwise, you can't tell. That was so informative. I have to uh, um, listen closely to a uh, pair and see who's doing the most singing. That seems the most likely way for us to be able to tell them apart. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, let's see. Then we had a question from Charlene asking whether morning doves uh, mate for life. Um, I think they do, but I'm not 100% sure. And one of the things when I was working at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they were doing more and more studies where they were finding multiple paternity in a great many birds that they never thought were unfaithful to their mates. And it was funny because John Fitzpatrick, who was the director of the lab, had done his PhD research on Florida scrub jays. And um, and it was Irby Levet in the evolutionary biology lab who was the one who was doing all these studies on the, the bloodlines and multiple paternity. And he told John that he was sure there was multiple paternity in scrub jays because there was in every kind of bird he tested. And John Fitzpatrick said, no way, no way would Florida scrub jays cheat on their mate. So they had genetic material going back generations because they were collecting a single feather from any birds and if they died they had the specimens and they with known mates and and known parentage and so they tested so many birds and they found zero cases of multiple paternity in florida scrub jays so oh. if you want a bird to put on a wedding card <laughs> and you're hoping the couple actually stays together, you might want to choose Florida scrub jays. <laughs> okay, and uh, another question uh, is whether cavities that are, have been stuffed with house wren sticks, are, would those cavities ever be used again by another species of songbird? Um, not easily, because they have to get all the stupid sticks out again. Um, the house wrens use that partly to keep other birds from using the cavity. It's to stake their claim. And the female house wren doesn't have any trouble getting through them and making the actual nest hidden uh, behind those sticks. Uh, but yeah, that does tend to close off the options for other birds using it unless people empty them out at the end of the season. And we have that problem with prothonotary warbler um, boxes that we built and they're always taken over by the house wrens. Yeah. Um, okay, then uh, Lynn asked, do most or all female songbirds have a brooding patch while sitting on the nest? And if males share that brooding duty, do they also have a brood patch? Some species, the males do have a brood patch, and in some, even when the males do some incubating, they don't. Oh. And uh, it, um, I don't know specific examples to give right now, 
but yeah, some uh, females almost always have it with songbirds, or always do, but the males sometimes do. Uh, chickadees don't, but they don't um, uh, share incubating duties. I'll have to look up. Uh, I don't think rose-breasted grosbeaks do, even though the males do help incubate. But a bander would know if a bander wants to jump in. Is there a bander in the house? Because <laughs> that's the thing banders look for. Well, in the absence of a bander, um, let's see, I have another question from Robert, who asked whether chickadees always excavate a cavity from scratch or can they modify an existing cavity? Uh, seems like that might save time and energy. Uh, yeah, and some chickadees will uh, uh, take over a downy woodpecker cavity. They like to, they have this like Bob Vila impulse in them where they want to feel like they've, they've done something to this old house. So when they take a woodpecker cavity, they often do a little bit more excavating on the floor. And that would also get rid of any hidden lice or mites uh, or other nasty things that might be hiding in the wood down there. Uh, sometimes they will also nest in birdhouses. And the way Cornell does, they do a, uh, several of the scientists at the Cornell lab do chickadee studies. They use PVC pipe tubes to make their nests and they, because it's easy to get access. Uh, I have plans for it on my webpage if you ever wanted to see what the way they do it but to uh they get their best probabilities of chickadees using a cavity if after uh, they stuff it with um, clean wood shavings or sawdust that from plywood uh from our un, uh, it has to be untreated natural wood uh to be safe but the chickadees like that feeling that they excavated it themselves but they've also used just regular old birdhouses. Um, birds are functionally illiterate, so they have never read any of the bird books that tell them how to behave. <laughs> um, let's see, we all have a question about your camera setup because your pictures are so phenomenal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I use, uh, I, I got my first camera when I worked at Cornell and actually had an income. And so I, everybody was using Canon. And if you buy, I don't think there's any difference in actual quality between Canon and Nikon, but whichever you get you're stuck with for life because you get lenses for it. And then if you get a new body, you want it to work with your lens, or if you get a new lens, you want it to work with your body. So you, you make a commitment. But I started out with a Canon 50D and worked my way up. Um, my current camera is their newest um, mirrorless one. And that's the, uh, but, um, the video I took of the chickadee was with my Canon 5D uh, that took the video. Uh, so, but yeah, and my uh, black cap chickadee pick, or my baby piping plovers from um, Maine, I think we're with the Canon 80D and their 100 to 400 lens, uh, the zoom lens. Okay, that's all very helpful for budding photographers. Um, the, the similar question was, what kind of setup do you have for your feeder camera? Uh, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the one with the great horn now was just uh, one of those Nest cams that you could buy from Amazon for like $79. And I just put it on one end of the feeder. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I put it on a brick looking out on my bird bath or things like that. You don't want it to be too far away because um, the, uh, the birds we're, I'm interested in are mainly tiny ones, uh, but you don't want it too close because some of them don't, uh, you want it as far back as you will get it in focus. So usually about three feet. Let's see, um, then Elaine asked whether there are certain types of flowers that replenish their nectar more rapidly than others. 
and if those flowers are more often visited by um, by birds. Um, I should know the answer to this because believe it or not, I just finished a book about plants for birds, but I never investigated how quickly uh, the hummingbird flowers replenish that nectar. Um, uh, the way, you know, the cardinal flowers, um, uh, jewel weed, uh, the flowers that hummingbirds love, uh, they're all listed in, you know, online, you can get all kinds of sources for the best ones. And uh, the important thing, if hummingbirds are using them, the flowers have evolved so that they want to lure hummingbirds in. So they're either replenishing the nectar or they are uh, quickly growing new flowers. Uh, but the trick is making sure that they're well enough watered so that they have the liquid to put into nectar. Well, we should get our hoses out. <laughs> um, let's see, then a question from Elaine. She said, this season, we had a bluebird nest in one of our boxes with all the feeding duties for four nestlings performed by a single female. And she wonders whether there are some songbirds that couldn't be successful if one of the pair was no longer present. Um, it, it really varies by species. Uh, one of the tragedies for burrowing owls, uh, the male furnishes all the food so if female died, you'd think they'd be fine, right? Except she's the only one that has the behavioral ability to feed the babies. He'll bring the food and just leave it there. So if she dies, the babies are doomed. And if he dies, the babies are doomed. They need two parents. Um, but with a lot of birds, you will definitely lose one or two if they only have one parent when they usually have two, especially in years where it's a little bit hard to find food because uh, it just is harder. But sometimes you will have uh, one bird who can keep all the babies going when it loses its mate, depending on how abundant the food is. And a lot on luck, because if there's only one parent, that lowers the chances of it detecting a predator or all kinds of things like that. I am not sure there, whether there are any more questions. Um, but I see we're, we're running uh, low on time. I see, oh, wait a minute, I hear one just came in from uh, asking about uh, asking if you could please share a little bit of your knowledge about barred owls and their nesting behavior. Um, this, the person asking the question said um, they'd had a chance to observe a baby one uh, in Michigan and read a little bit about them and she's interested in them and thought she might have heard a baby again today. Oh, uh, they do nest around Chicago, though my lifer barred owl uh, at the Morton Arboretum oh. turned out to be just a knot, the a two knots that made perfect dark eyes on a limb. It was very depressing because it <laughs> turned out not to be a bird at all. Um, the babies are in the nest. Uh, they're very dependent on the parents pretty much through into the fall, but they, um, they're toddlers while they're in the nest and cannot fly. They start moving to the edge of the nest and land and uh, kind of working their way onto the branch and the parents will feed them, but they often end up falling out of a tree and they have to clamber either, they can't get up the trunk usually with their you know big feet, but they can get into something nearby with low branches and they're very dependent. The parents keep feeding them. They make really funny screechy calls at nighttime when they're begging. So do great horned owls. So it can be a little tricky to tell which one it is because you'd have both in the Chicago area, but um, they are, uh, they feed on a lot of 
Um, they're sort of the nocturnal version of red-shouldered hawks, where great horned owls are the nocturnal version of red-tailed hawks. And both red-shouldered hawks and barred owls eat a lot of cold-blooded vertebrates, frogs and um, snakes and things like that, more than great horned owls and red-tailed hawks do. But um, and the babies stay with the parents, the family stays together. And in fall, that's when the babies start just kind of moving off and the parents start getting a little bit territorial about their winter space. And the babies have to find a, their own winter space. Well, I, I think I speak for everyone who's had the honor of listening to your talk and I hope everybody will run out and buy the book. <laughs> Thank you for um, talking with us. I'd like to pass this on to Judy Pollack, um, president of Chicago Audubon Society, uh, for our closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Uh, and thanks so much, Laura, uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. I, I know we all learned so much. And um, I, you know, I hope you're looking at the, the chat right now because there's so many positive comments. People really enjoyed it. Um, and we had over 90 people watching between um, the Zoom and the Facebook. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And um, uh, you know, as we said before, this is uh, sponsored by Chicago Audubon, Chicago Ornithological and the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. Um, and so our next, uh, we hope that you'll, um, you'll join us again for our, the next one in our Compelling Voices series. We're actually gonna be back in person uh, you know, hopefully, uh, of course, we'll keep an eye on um, what's going on, what the authorities are recommending at that time. But um, the current plan is for this to be in person at the Nature Museum. Um, uh, it'll be 6 p.m. on November 18th. And um, we usually do like a half hour of a ha happy hour before the program. Uh, so you can come and uh, buy yourself something to drink and chat for a bit in person. And uh, that program is gonna be Wind Birds Over the Windy City, Stories of Shorebird Conservation by Abby Sterling. Um, and so she's from the East Coast, but she'll be talking a little bit about shorebird conservation, including uh, talking about our plovers. So that should be a really, really great program. And we hope to see you there. Um, so yes, again, uh, again, thank you, Laura. I, I think that this program was, was a real hit uh, and we really appreciate you bringing your, your knowledge to us and thank all of you for coming and we hope to see you next time.